Ahmed Galani is accused of being part of the 1998 bombings of U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. His trial was supposed to be the great opportunity for the administration to show that federal courts can handle trials of Guantanamo Bay detainees. Last week, though, federal prosecutors shot that idea kind of to shreds, deciding against appealing a ruling by a trial judge that prohibits a key witness from testifying in the government's case. Where does this leave the Obama pledge to restore the rule of law? Well, the timing couldn't be worse for obvious reasons. But luckily for Obama, Tea Partiers and critics on the right don't shout half as loudly about Big Brother Gitmo-style government as they do about big government mouth care. But come to think of it, why is that? There's a new poll on attitudes towards government, more big bad brother news, and a whole lot more to discuss with our constitutional rights correspondent, Vince Warren of the Center for Constitutional Rights, next. Ahmed Gulani accused of conspiring with others in the 1998 bombings of U.S. embassies in Tanzania and Kenya. 224 people were killed, including a dozen Americans. Now, last week, a judge banned a key witness from testifying, a man prosecutors say sold explosives to Gulani. Judge Kaplan ruled today that the Constitution is the rock upon which our nation rests. We could not agree more with the court. This case will be tried upon lawful evidence, not torture, not coercion. Vince, am I making too much out of this Galani decision? No, I think you're exactly right. Uh, Judge Kaplan did say that the Constitution is the basis for how this case should be tri tried. And in fact, what we're looking at now is an opportunity for Mr. Galani to be tried based on fair, clean evidence and not based on evidence obtained by torture and yeah. coercion. I mean, that was the point, that the witness was found out about in, in, in interrogation of Mr. Galani in another country, in a CIA site? Mr. Galani uh, had a a long trip, part of which, which was in Guantanamo and part of which was in secret CIA detention. And during his detention, uh, he was severely abused and there was information that was coerced out of him, allegedly including uh, the name of this person who uh, the government wants to use as a witness. What the judge ruled was uh, that while the, the, the case should move forward and can move forward, that the government cannot rely on this witness because his name and information was gotten through illegal means. So there may not be problems except for the Obama administration's likelihood of getting a conviction. Well, we have to put this in perspective. The government can try cases in a lot of different ways. I think what it's going to do is it's going to make it more difficult and it might take them a little bit longer to put this evidence forward, but I don't think that they're giving up on uh, putting this evidence into play. I just think that they need to do it in a way that comports with the law. Last time we talked with you, we were talking about the, uh, the case of the man detained when he was 15, Omar Khadr. What's the status of that case? Uh, Omar, Omar Khadr, the case is, is moving forward, and um, I think similar to the, what we're seeing in the Galani case is that we're dealing with these very key questions about what's the proper venue for these cases to move forward in. Here we have Galani's case that's moving forward, the first case going in federal trials, and we have Omar Khadr's case, the first uh, child soldier that's being brought before a tribunal in uh, over 40 years. And so there's a tremendous contrast, but I think what we can see is that the government and the courts are taking very seriously the idea of how to use coerced evidence in proving the government. And then case. some people are taking seriously how to use courts, including somebody who claims they were tortured by the U.S. at Guantanamo Bay. That case is coming to trial. Will it come to trial soon? Well, there was a case that was recently filed uh, on behalf of a man named Aljanko, who was a Syrian person, and he was has a very interesting uh, journey as well. He was someone that was captured, I believe, in uh, 2000 or 2001 by the Taliban, and he was tortured by al-Qaeda activists as being a U.S. spy. He was then liberated by the U.S., and rather than releasing him, they detained him and interrogated him base, on the basis of the videotapes that he'd made in his al-Qaeda torture. And then he was held in Guantanamo from 2002 till he was released in 2009. Now, when he was released in 2009, uh, a judge actually released him because of the habeas corpus case that he filed. So he is the first person that was released after a judge said he had no business being detained and now he is in another country and he's filing a damages action for, for compensation for his abuse that happened uh, under U.S. forces. All right, so a lot to keep you busy on the Guantanamo and torture front. Um, let's talk a little bit more broadly for a minute. Um, you've got 
the vice, the former vice president, Dick Cheney, emerging from I don't know how many heart operations, but the last one, uh, being interviewed at a business forum by his wife, Lynn Cheney. And among other things, saying his biggest fear now uh, is a terrorist with a nuke, and rehashing the old line of how all of these anti-terror um, measures put in place by his administration and continued by Obama have kept this country safe. Of course it gets headlines, because everything he says gets headlines, um, but is there anything new in anything that he said, and are you concerned that he's now on this nuclear terror bandwagon? You know, Dick Cheney, it, coming out of retirement is very much like the Rocky movies. There never seems to be an end <laughs> to when we hear from him again. But he's not saying anything new. And I think his discussion is a lot more desperate than in the past, primarily because we now have these cases finally moving to trial in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So that he can't rely on the scare tactics that he's used in the past. That now we have evidence that are before the courts. And the courts are showing that they're more than capable of dealing with these threats as they arrive. And while we're talking about threats, let's make up, come closer to home. There was an extraordinary story out of Pennsylvania recently about how the state had contracted with an independent institute to surveil terror threats. And guess who they surveilled? Well, mostly they were surveilling protesters, people campaigning against natural gas drilling, the anti-fracking activists. What's been the fallout there? Well, one of the things that Dick Cheney said in his remarks was that he was very concerned about homegrown terrorists. And what we see in the Pennsylvania situation is now we have the Pennsylvania government that is working with private contractors to begin to surveil and infiltrate political movements. There is nothing illegal about protesting gas fracking and other environmental disasters. And now we have uh, private, uh, private contractors that are determining for the government um, who is dangerous and who is not. This is precisely the thing, and this flows from the Bush-Cheney era of trying to get the government more deeply into private conduct and horribly into dissent. Mm -hmm. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing the, dis the death of dissent through these types of... Well, and uh, one of the reasons that I love to bring you on is because you remind me there are people on the, of the progressive bent who are talking about this stuff. Because if you watched the election campaigns, you would think that the only people talking about big government were on the right, and the only big government they're talking about uh, has something to do with health care. Here's the only guy I could find recently talking about the case that you've been raising around the government's right to assassinate Americans. Ron Paul on MSNBC. Take a look. It depends on what people believe. If you have term limits and people come in and they believe the same ideas about big government and big war and violation of our civil liberties and torture and assassinations, you bring those people in after term limits, you haven't changed anything. Is Ron Paul in Texas the only guy talking about this on the campaign trail? Well, apparently so. Um, the Democrats seem to be running away from the big government issue. And I think it's primarily because the Democrats see an opportunity to look at national security as an issue that will move the party forward. The big problem is that one of the biggest issues in big government right now is not what they do to small business owners. It's how they spy on you and how they spy on me and our computers and our cell phones. Just look at the raids that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. That is the big government issue that the Republicans certainly aren't talking about. The Democrats don't want to talk Talk about, but that really is the key issue for us. And that's why we rely on you and the Center for Constitutional Rights. Vince Warren, our constitutional rights correspondent. You can find a whole lot more about CCR at grittv.org. Thanks.